Thank you for joining us for this episode of The Pilgrim's Pulpit, a ministry of Josh Pilgrim, pastor of Riverview Baptist Church in Calhoun, Georgia. Our aim is to produce faithful, maturing disciples of Jesus through passionate, Christ-centered, expositional preaching. As Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. You have a Bible? Uh, we're in Galatians chapter 2. We've been studying the book of Galatians together. And what I hope has been true for you is we've studied through the Bible, through this book of the Bible, that the themes of the scriptures are making sense. You're seeing how all of these passages fit together. So we're in Galatians chapter 2. Now I'm going to ask if you'll stand in honor and reverence for the reading of God's word. This morning I want to preach to you on this subject, the railroad and the ladder. The railroad and the ladder. From Galatians 2, beginning in verse 15, remember this is Paul addressing Peter's hypocrisy and he's continuing on. In verse 15, he says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 17, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is God's word to us, the railroad and the ladder. Let's pray. Father, you speak to us now through your word, by your Holy Spirit, guide us into the truth, convict us of sin and righteousness and the judgment to come, save sinners, encourage saints. Point us to Jesus as the hero of the Bible and show us, above all things, that none of our works count for anything for our salvation, but it is by faith alone in Christ and His finished work by which we are saved. Would you teach us that this morning in Jesus' name? And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. This morning, I want to start with a simple question. I want you to think about it. The question is, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? Is it a person who lives a certain way? Is it a person who attends church regularly? Is it a person who gives money to the church? Is it a person who tries to do well? Is it a person that tries to live a good life? Is it a person who reads their Bible on a regular basis? What is... A Christian. John Piper said this, and I think this ties in with our passage this morning. He says, a Christian is a person who has died with Christ, whose stiff neck has been broken, whose proud forehead has been shattered, whose stony heart has been crushed, whose pride has been slain, and whose life is now mastered by Jesus Christ. That's a Christian. It's a person who dies to themselves and realizes that no effort of their own could ever make themselves right with God. They die to their own works, die to their own effort, and they put all of their hope in Jesus, and they allow Him to, lead, to live His life through them. 
In the book of Galatians, in chapter 2, we've seen three pictures. In verses 1 to 10, we saw a picture of legalism. Jews who were forcing Gentiles, non-Jews, to live like Jews, to keep Jewish laws in order to be acceptable to God. Legalism is when you have right behavior with wrong belief. You're trying to do right things, but you have the wrong belief about those right things. You think those right things you do somehow make you right with God. That's wrong belief. It's legalism. Now last week in verses 11 to 14, we saw a picture of hypocrisy. Peter stopped eating with Gentiles when the Jews showed up. Hypocrisy is when you have the right belief, but the wrong actions. You say the right thing, but you don't live it out. And now what we find in verses 15 to 21 is a third picture. It's a picture of faith. Paul emphasizes what really makes us right with God. It is faith, not works. This is when we put together both things, right belief and right behavior. So just to remind you of what we studied last week, if you weren't here, last week we read of the Apostle Paul's confrontation of Peter in his hypocrisy as he got up from the Gentile lunch table to go eat with the Jews out of fear of the opinions of other people. Remember, Paul, Paul, Peter knows his freedom. He knows he can eat with Gentiles. He knows it doesn't make him unclean. He knows he can eat bacon and pork and, and it will be okay. But out of fear of what the other Jewish believers would think, he got up from the table with the Gentiles and went back to sit with the Jews. And he dragged with him Barnabas and all of the other Jewish brothers into hypocrisy. And Paul points out that Peter's actions were not in step with the gospel. He wasn't living in line with the gospel that he proclaimed. But if we're honest, it's not just Peter who struggles with this, is it? Anybody else here struggle to live out the life that you say you believe with your mouth? Legalism is looking to something besides Jesus Christ in order to be acceptable and clean before God. Legalists put their trust in religion. Legalism always results in pride and fear, and it leads to exclusion and social strife. And so legalism can appear as many different things. In our country, it can appear as nationalism which is this inherent belief that our race or our culture is superior to others. America, right? We're just better. We're just better because we won all the wars and, and we're just a better country, right? We're better. When we look at the poverty of Africa or we, we look at the, the wickedness and the evil in the Middle East and, and the strife that's there, we look to our country and inherently, we may not say it out loud, but we think America's better. Now, don't get me wrong. America is a great place to live. I would not want to live in any other country in the world than in this country. But let's not be deceived and think that because we're American, we're better. Because since 1973, our country has murdered 60 million babies. 60 million. We've legalized in the courts things that God explicitly denounces. We approve what is evil and we call what is evil good. It's this idea that we're better. And it can, it can express itself even in the church. Where we may not say this, but there may be someone who comes in that's different from us. They dress different than us. They smell different from us. They act different from us. And we politely sit beside those other people in the church, but we won't eat with them. What I mean by eat with them is we won't really become friends with them. We won't socialize with them. We won't share our lives and our homes and our things with them. We will just keep our relationships formal and we will see them at official church meetings only. That's exactly what Peter did when he got up from the Gentile table to sit at the Jew table. Is He said, I'm not going to associate with those people. Now you may be polite and you may say hello on Sunday morning but there's really no interaction with people different from us any other day of the week. Or we take our own preferences too seriously and we put moral significance on what is really only cultural. 
We may think that our taste in Christian music is better or superior because we're contemporary or we lift our hands or we don't lift our hands. And what you can have is two groups of people in the church at the same time looking down on the other because they worship differently. Well, they they don't lift their hands. I lift my hands, so I'm more spiritual. And the person over here is saying, those people lift their hands. They're fanatical. I keep my hands down because I'm more solemn. I'm more serious in worship, and so I'm better. And it can go both ways. I like contemporary. I like southern gospel. I like hymns. I like a pipe organ. I like a djembe. I like a cappella. It doesn't matter. The point is that it's easy for us to put our preferences above other people's preferences, and we think we're better because our, we like our preferences better than their preferences, and that's called legalism. And it leads to all sorts of divisions in the body of Christ. Well, I tucked in my shirt this morning. Well, Pastor didn't tuck in his shirt this morning. <gasps> I'm better because I, I wore a suit or I wore a tie or I dressed up or my shirt has a collar. My shirt, my jeans have holes in them, so I'm better because I'm stylish. You know, you, this can be silly, but we can look down at everybody else because we look different and there's these cultural preferences. All this comes from not living in line with the gospel. Without the gospel, our hearts have to manufacture self-esteem by comparing our group with other groups. But the gospel tells us that we are all unclean without Christ. And we are all clean with Him. So how did Paul address Peter's wrong behavior? Paul speaks to the pull behind Peter's actions rather than to his behavior. Paul did not focus so much on the sinful behavior as much as Peter's sinful attitude. Paul's basic line is this. Peter, God, this is all from last week, okay? Paul, uh, Peter, God did not have fellowship with you on the basis of your race and culture and though you were good and you were devout, your race and your customs and your Jewish background, Peter, had nothing to do with it. Therefore, Peter, how can you have fellowship with others on the basis of their race and culture? Do you get it? God doesn't treat you that way. God doesn't treat you better because you're Jewish or you're not. So why would you treat people differently based on their race or their ethnicity or their background or their gender? You see how this can cause division and how it, it gets out of line with the gospel? Paul does not simply say that racism is a sin, which it is. Peter was being racist. But what does he do? He uses the gospel to show Peter the spiritual roots of the mistake he's making. Paul says the roots of racism and legalism at the very root is a resistance to the gospel of salvation. It is forgetting that we are saved by grace. And so Paul addresses the real issue. Peter's failure to believe the gospel. I, meet, I met with Kenneth Price this, this Friday, and we're reading a book together called What is the Gospel? And I told him, I said, 10 years ago, man, I had this, I have this theory, and it's proven true ever since, that every problem, every issue... Every bad thing that arises in the local church stems from fundamentally a denial or a misapplication or a lack of belief in the gospel. You talk about anything you want to, whatever problem, whatever sin that arises, any cause of division, it points ultimately back to, in one way or another, we have not applied the gospel to our lives here. This is why you can, you can, parents, you know this, you can correct the bad behavior of your children all day long. But if you don't address the reason why they misbehave, that their hearts are unclean and they are resisting and rebelling against God, then you'll never see a true change of heart. Even if your kids temporarily change their behavior, I can get my son to act right. Usually it involves physical force, right? I can get him to act right. But that doesn't mean that his heart has changed. Instead of motivating our children by guilt, we should motivate them by grace and with the gospel. See, this is what Paul does with Peter. If Paul had only said, Peter, your cultural superiority is a violation of God's rules, 
Well, then what would have happened? Peter still would have been a coward. He still would have feared what other people thought about him. His fear of man would have been unaddressed. It would have lied dormant in his heart, and it would later express itself in a different way. If you don't get to the root of the issue, the weeds will keep growing and sprouting in the garden of your heart. But instead, what does Paul do? Paul reminds Peter that he's already justified. He says, Peter, you don't need the approval of these men because you already have the approval of God. God already approves of you in Christ. Why do you need the approval of men? You've forgotten the gospel. And that leads us to our passage today. How can you gain the approval of Christ? Because there's a lot of church folks that are still trying to earn it. They're still trying to earn it. They're trying to use effort and they're trying to work their way to God's approval and they think God's pleased with them because of what they do. What is it that makes a person truly right with God? Is it religion? Moral behavior? Is it cleaning our own lives up? Is it doing our best and hoping God just forgives the rest? No! Say that again. No! That's not good news. The climax of Paul's speech to Peter in front of them all comes in verses 15 to 16. And now that's where we come to the Scriptures today. He's still talking to Peter. He says, Peter, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, and yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Paul tells Peter, Peter, forget about the Gentiles for just a minute. Forget about them. We know they're outside of the covenant. We know they're hopeless without God. But even we Jews, we could claim all of the privileges of the chosen people. Even we had to realize that no one could be justified by observing the law. It's not just that God will punish your bad deeds on Judgment Day. It's that God will punish your good deeds on Judgment Day. Because even your righteousness is like filthy rags in His sight. They're not good enough. This is why Paul says, All that was good that I considered gain in my life as a Jewish leader, I consider it loss. And so he says, We are justified by faith. Those are precious words in the Bible. And I would say that you should spend the rest of your life getting your mind around what those words mean. What does it mean that we are justified by faith alone? Those words started the Protestant Reformation. Those words wrecked Martin Luther when he had to get his mind around that. What does it mean that I'm not justified before God by my effort, but by faith alone? It is the central message to the Christian faith. It is Paul's summary of the good news in a nutshell. This is the message, justification by faith, is the message every person in the world needs to hear and Christians need to be daily reminded of, even Peter. Can you all just be reminded, Paul's still talking to Peter here. Think about this. If Peter, the Apostle Peter, needed to learn more about justification by faith. Don't you think it's likely that we do too? That we haven't graduated from that yet? You see, it's not just that you believe the gospel as a Christian and then move on to bigger and better and deeper things. It is that you grow as a Christian in your life from beginning to end, learning more and more what it means that you are justified by faith alone. The gospel is not just the first step in your Christian life. It is the entire staircase. And what you spend the rest of your life trying to do is figure out how does the gospel apply to every area of my life? How does it apply to how I treat my wife? How does it apply to how I raise my children? How does it apply to how I serve in the church? How does it apply to how I receive help in the church? How does it apply to how I sing in the church? How does it apply to how I go on missions in the church? How does it apply how I use my spiritual gifts in the church? How does it apply how I do my job? How I go to work? How I serve my family? How I work at home? How I take care of my yard? How I take care of my bank account? It affects every area of your life. So what is it? What is justification by faith? Justification is a legal term. 
It's a legal declaration. The judge is saying something about you. And here's what the judge says. In Christ, even though we are actually sinners, we are not under condemnation. God accepts us despite our sin because through the death and resurrection of Jesus, God has cleansed our hearts by faith and not by our religious deeds. So I'm going to give you guys a a brief definition of justification. Justification is the gracious act of God. It's God's grace and it's God's act by which God declares. He's saying something. He declares a sinner righteous. And they are righteous or in right standing with God solely on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. That's justification. And that message sparked the Protestant Reformation and it can spark revival at Riverview Baptist Church if we get our minds around this. We are not acceptable to God because we have actually cleaned ourselves up and become righteous. It's the opposite. We become actually right with God because we are acceptable to Him through Jesus. And this is where Peter and the Judaizers went wrong. The Judaizers, even the Jews, they were given the law. What was the purpose of the law? It was a guide. Jackie, it was a railroad track. It was a railroad track that was to lead them to God by grace. They were never to think that the law was meant to to be something they earned. You get on this railroad track, it will guide you and get on the choo-choo train of the sacrifices and the atonement and the work of the priest and the tabernacle. Let those things guide you on the railroad tracks of the law to show you how to live and by grace you will get to God. Here's what the Judaizers did. And here's even what some Baptists do. They took the law as a railroad track and they lifted it up from the ground and they put it up straight in the air and they turned that railroad track into a ladder. So now by my effort, I will climb every rung. By my obedience and my effort, I will climb my way up to God. I don't need God's help. I'll do it on my own. And they turned the railroad into a ladder thinking that they could somehow earn their way to heaven. This is what Paul is trying to tell Peter in verse 16. If we are justified by faith in what Christ has done, then we are also not justified by what we do. Observing the law is not what saves. That's what Paul means. Look at verse 19. When he says in verse 19, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. Can I just give you a little nugget this morning? The Ten Commandments were never intended to show you how good you could be. The Ten Commandments are intended to show you how bad you are. Did you catch that? That changes the way you read the Bible. changes the way you read the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments and the law are not intended to show you how good you could be, but to show you how bad you are. You ever taken the, the good person test? Are you a good person this morning? It's a great question to ask anybody who's not a Christian or a Christian who needs to hear the gospel again. Are you a good person? Well, just take this little test. How many lies have you told in your lifetime? What do you call somebody who tells lots of lies? A liar. You ever stolen anything, regardless of the value? If you've stolen something, thou shalt not steal, you're a thief. You ever taken God's name in vain? It's called blasphemy. Jesus said if you look at a woman... With lust in your heart that a man's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Have you ever looked with lust? I asked one guy that one time. He said, I said, have you ever told any lies? Yeah, a lot. I said, what are you, a liar? I said, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? He said, no. I said, you just said you're a liar, right? Right? And let's be real, if we went through all the, that, that's just four of the Ten Commandments. Anybody not guilty? Anybody want to raise their hand in this, in this assembly and say, I, I didn't do any of those things? All right. That's just four of the Ten Commandments. And the whole point is that all the Ten Commandments, none of us love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and none of us love our neighbors ourselves. That's not good news for you. That's bad news. 
And that's why Paul says in verse 19, I died to the law. Because when I looked into the mirror of the law, when I turned that law up as a ladder and I looked at it, I realized I could never climb that high. I can't climb. I can't earn it. I can't do anything because I have broken the law. And to the law, I die. Have you died to the law? Have you stopped trying to earn God's favor by your moral effort? Paul is not saying that we should no longer obey the law of God at all. What it does mean is that Paul died to the law as a way of being saved. There's no hope in that ladder. It's a dead end. You'll never get that high. But what about verses 17 and 18? These verses seem quite obscure. Let's read them. He says, but if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Let me read this in another way and help you understand these two verses. In other words, Paul is saying, if someone who knows that they are justified by faith, if that person sins, is it because justification by faith in Christ promotes sin? Not at all. But if someone who professes faith in Christ keeps on with the same sinful lifestyle, rebuilding the sinfulness that Christ died to destroy the penalty for, making no effort to change, then it proves that this person never really grasped the gospel, but they were looking for an excuse to live in disobedience to God. If you go back to the law, like the Judaizers were doing in some of these Galatian churches, if you go back to the law as a, as a way to be saved, then you forsake Christ. So how should a saved person view their life? Verse 19 explains that because Paul died to the law, we can now live for God. Before he came to faith, Paul was trying to save himself through keeping the law. But Paul was never really living for God. He was being moral and he was being good, but it was all for Paul and never for God. Paul says now that he's been justified by faith and not his works, Paul has a new motive for obedience, a new motive that is much more powerful. What's the motive? Verse 20 says, I simply want to live for the one who gave himself for me and loved me. Why do we obey God? Is it so he'll love us? Or accept us? Or that we can get to heaven? Paul obeyed not to get something from God, but because he loved God. So verse 19 could be read like this. The law itself showed me that I could never make myself acceptable through the law. So I stopped living to it. I died to the law as my savior. And though I obeyed God before, it was simply to get something from him. It was for my own sake. But now I obey him simply to please him. I'm crucified with Christ. And that helps us make sense of these two verses. You ever thought the irony? That Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ and yet I live. I don't know if you know this or not, but not many people got off the cross and survived. You don't get on a cross and be crucified and live. It's a death sentence. And yet this is how we live our lives as Christians. This tension of being dead and alive at the same time. We are to live our life on the basis of who we are in Christ. What does it mean in verse 20 to be crucified with Christ? What does it mean that Christ lives in us and that we are justified in Him? Hear these words. It means that I am as free from condemnation before God as if I had already died and had been judged, as if I had paid the debt myself. And I am as loved by God as if I had lived the life Christ lived. You're crucified with Christ, meaning that you are considered dead. Your sin has been paid for in Jesus. And yet the life you live is the life Christ lives in you. And here's what blows my mind away. When you get there on judgment day and you stand before God and all of your sin and all of your uh, filthy works and you stand before him and your life is displayed for all to see and you are judged on those things. 
God will look at you and He will not say, you are a sinner saved by grace. That's not justification. Justification, this will blow your mind. God looks at all your sin. He looks at all your failures. He looks at every way you've fallen short. All of your guilt. All of your condemnation. And then He looks over to the perfect righteousness of Christ crucified in your place, lived the life in your place, fulfilled the law in your place, and then He looks back at you, the sinner, and He says, not guilty. Not not just I'm guilty and I'm going to let you go free. Not guilty. Perfect. Perfectly accepted. All my sins washed away. That is justification. It's not just that He pulls up your sin and says, yeah, you did all this, but I'm going to let you go free because Jesus paid your debt. He not only paid your debt, He fulfilled the law, and now in Him I am considered righteous. Perfect. You're perfect now. You don't have to earn His love. You don't have to earn your way. He loves you. He's accepted you in Christ. Have you been using the law as a railroad or a ladder? Have you been trying to climb the ladder of the law to God by your own works? Or are you being carried on the railroad of the law by the locomotive of Christ and His work? Get on the choo-choo train of Jesus today and ride Him and let His engine of grace, His merit, His works, His life, let that be what carries you on this railroad and we still live according to God's Word. But that does not earn the way. Jesus is the one on the... on the, uh, He's the conductor. He's the one on the pe- pedaling. He's the one driving this train. He's the one that's going to get you there, not you. And this is what Paul's teaching Peter. The Christian life is about living in line with the gospel for the whole of life, for all of our lives. And so you must go on as a Christian the same way you started. That's that's next week. Religion can never save you because if it did, verse 21 says, Jesus died for nothing. When you try to earn your way, you're saying, I don't need Jesus' death. I can do it on my own. And you would nullify the grace of God, as verse 21 says. And that's the point. Friends, today, hear this. Christ will either do everything for you or He'll do nothing for you. You cannot combine merit and grace. If we could save ourselves, then Christ's death is pointless and it means nothing. And yet today, if you realize you cannot save yourselves, then Christ's death and resurrection will mean everything to you. And He will spend the life that He has given us We will spend the life that God has given us in joyful service of Him, bringing our whole lives into line with the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word today. Thank You for this reminder of Your grace. Father, we keep hearing it week in and week out, but we need to keep hearing it week in and week out because we are quick to forget. Father, as we sing now about Your amazing grace, Would you remind your church that we are not saved by our works or for keeping the law, but through faith in Christ alone. Elevate our faith today. Lift up our eyes to Jesus and take hope in Him that our sins are forgiven and that we are righteous in Him. Father, help us as Christians to live a crucified life, dying to our old ways and living a life by faith for the one who loved us and gave Himself for us. Father, for the person who has wandered in here to church today, and has heard this message, and it's landed in their heart for the first time, I pray you would bring conviction of sin and bring them to repentance, turning away in repentance, not just from their sin, but from their own righteousness, that they would put their faith in the righteousness of Christ, putting their faith in His death, His life, His resurrection. Save someone today, Father. Do it by your mercy. Awaken people to the gospel. Father, now help us as Christians to sing of this great truth and worship. In Jesus' name, amen.